It looks like it is showtime in Caguas, Puerto Rico. Bienvenidos a Puerto Rico, todos. Good morning. This is Dr. Minarsik. It's Monday. It's November 12th. It's what we call Veterans Day in the United States. And we are in the United States, a part of the United States uh, that's very proud to be called Puerto Rico. We are in Caguas, Puerto Rico at San Juan Bautista School of Medicine broadcasting to you live all over the world. This is session number 18 of Global Online Medical School Pathology, and it's 8 o'clock here in Puerto Rico, which is uh, called AST for Atlantic Standard Time, as opposed to CST, or Central Standard Time, which is where I usually broadcast from in Chicago. You're probably wondering why every time I open up the show, I say, we're in Chicago. Well, so far, every session, the first 17 sessions, we have been in Chicago. But today, we're in Puerto Rico. 
the first song that opened us uh, up this morning, which you may not have uh, thought was as good a quality as most of our songs, was by a very famous Puerto Rican superstar named Mark Anthony. And uh, that's how we opened up the show. And uh, I guess after all of those basic introductions, we can go through our usual pathology exam and ask you a few questions. Well, uh, we have a little bit of a different system here than we usually have, so I'm a little bit nervous at first. For example, I know, for example, that the music was not as good as it usually sounds. That could partly be because of the system we have here, or maybe the song itself. I'll play more and they may sound better. We may experiment a little bit. The first question for your pathology exam is, can you hear me? Now, can I ask you, can you hear me as well as you usually do? Is there an echo? Is it tinny? Do you need, to? okay, good. That means the hearing part is good. Now, here's the important question. Uh, can you see the screen very well? Uh, for example, uh, let's test the resolution. Do you see my pointer here? What is the color of the uh, bean that is, it is encircling? Okay, now what is that word right there? Right there, what is that word? Can you read it? Yeah, this is, these are jelly bellies. They're not just jelly beans, but they are jelly bellies. The uh, jelly belly factory is actually close to my house in Chicago, but uh, they're really appreciated all over the world, and they're one of my favorite things. I believe I actually took this picture myself by pouring a bunch of them onto my coffee table one day. Good. We're cooking, and uh, I think, uh, as they used to say on the uh, I Love Lucy show way before you were born, we got some big splaining to do today because there have been some changes and I want to make sure that everybody is clear. First of all, I'm surprised that there are so many people here because we've had a, a, a pause in our uh, broadcast and we've had changes in times and changes in locations and changes in technology. So I'm really, really glad to see even one person come back. And there's like a whole bunch of you out there. So uh, thanks for staying with us. Uh, I think the main uh, thing I wanted to start to tell you is that uh, Puerto Rico it really rocks. This is really, really a nice, nice little, I don't know, I can't call it a state, I can't call it a country. They call it a commonwealth, but it's part of the United States, but it's also a Caribbean island. In fact, it's one of the four major or greater Caribbean islands. That's why it's one of the, what they call the greater Antilles, along with Cuba and Hispaniola and Jamaica. This is a great place, it has all the charm of the Caribbean and all of the convenience of the United States. Uh, I guess we should start by saying why we had the break and uh, why we have uh, made a few changes here. That would be a nice way to start out before I start slapping a lot of renal pathology on you. So give me a, about five minutes. Um, as you know, I am dedicated to giving this course no matter what corner of the world I'm in. That's my highest priority. And if I go to a corner of the world that doesn't allow me to broadcast, then I don't go there. It's as simple as that. The administration here at San Juan Batista has been very, very enlightened, and they understand the value uh, and the Hippocratic mandate to share our knowledge freely. So all of the classes that I'll be giving here uh, starting Thursday will also be simultaneously broadcast to you as well. So I guess we could call that a, uh, <clears throat> rather than a webinar, I guess we could call it a live webinar because it's going to be both to live students standing and sitting in front of me, very nice people that I've met already, as well as all of you out there around the world. So this has been very exciting for me. I've done this several times before. The first time I did it, it was pretty successful, but we used the technology that was not great. Last year when we did it, the technology was a lot better, but there were some other little technical problems regarding sound, and uh, we fixed all of those this year. So I suspect when Thursday comes, we are going to uh, really rock. Now, why aren't the students here today? Well, the live students are not here today because 
uh, there's going to be a little bit of an overlap. They have another pathology lecture with an excellent uh, uh, renal doctor uh, that uh, we have decided to uh, um, not, uh, what's the word? We don't want to conflict with him. So I'll be able to give you the renal pathology, the way a pathologist does it, while a real kidney doctor is lecturing to the students. Now, when Thursday comes, we're going to have uh, after you have had two sessions of renal pathology, we're going to have a renal review and a renal uh, histopathology session as well, because I know how much you like the renal histopathology sessions with my microscope. And the students will be able to see my microscope with their live eyeballs looking at the screen while you're looking at it by virtue of uh, internet transmission. Okay, is there anything else I want to say uh, I, I still am a little bit insecure. I still want to have a couple of people tell me that the sound that you hear from my voice is as good as it has been before because I'm not using my regular microphone. And I keep thinking, I know the music wasn't as good. Uh, let me ask you this. Was the music downright lousy? Come on, be honest. Okay, but you could at least hear that it was music, right? Okay, let me ask, I'm not using my usual speakers with the subwoofer, so let me ask you another question. I'm going to play a small clip from our next music, and I want you to tell me if it sounds better than the first one. Here it goes. So was that better? Okay, so it's poor quality. Okay, well, we're, we'll, we'll probably be recording it in poor quality too, but you have reassured me that the important part, the voice part, is as clear as it used to be. So I don't think we're gonna be improving the music much. When we broadcast from the auditorium, we may use the overhead speakers, which may help it a little bit, but no matter what we do, we're gonna blast it and we're gonna rock and roll every session. Okay. Uh, we've taken a lot of time for introductions, so let's go into the part that I worked really hard on, and it's called renal pathology, pathology of the kidney. And uh, this is probably a good place to start. Uh, let's zip this up a little bit so you can see our lecture notes, if possible. Uh, let's see. Am I able to zip this up a little bit? Ah, it won't let me. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, it's very important that I'm able to put this up, so let me try again. It's not really behaving itself too well, so I may have to make it a little bit smaller. Oh, let's see what happens when I do that. Oh, it's punishing me for not registering this product. That did not happen last night. So... Let's see, how are we going to fix that? Oh, I guess it won't let me fix it. Well, I guess you don't get to see the lecture notes, so I don't get to share with you all the things I wanted to share. Okay. Um, pathology of the kidney. This is a chapter in Robbins uh, that I used to really hate because there was a lot of technical material, about, especially about glomerular diseases. And it was always very, very uh, conflicting with logic. And over the years, I've decaffeinated quite a bit and actually love this chapter now because I think I have uh, rearranged it in such a way that you are not going to fear every time you hear the word glomerulonephropathy. You're going to kind of remember a general nice way that they are all uh, uh, categorized. So what we'll be talking about in this session as well as in the next two hour session tomorrow at the same time is renal pathology. We'll be talking about the normal aspects of the kidney, normal anatomy, normal histology. We'll be talking about the congenital diseases, the errors of development. We'll be dealing with this uh, concept of cysts of various types. Uh, we'll be talking uh, a large amount of time on the glomerular diseases. A disease of the glomerulus is called a glomerulonephropathy, and it is also 
called a glomerulonephritis uh, generally. There's a few minor subtle differences, but for the most part, they're the same. The uh, second part of the large discussion will be on tubular diseases. And then we'll spend a good amount of time talking about diseases of blood vessels. And isn't it kind of interesting because when you look here at my original picture, you could see that you have a glomerulus here, you have a blood vessel here, and you have a lot of tubules here, both proximal and distal, and collecting tubules, leading to the collecting tubules of various types. So when, when you visualize the kidney microscopically, you know that instantly when you look at a slide and you see glomeruli, you know you're dealing with kidney. When you look at blood vessels, you know that uh, you're dealing with blood vessels. These are slam dunk things. And otherwise, every little epithelial sort of circular structure in the re in the kidney, renal cortex, as well as the medulla is tubule. So even the classical uh, textbooks devoted to nothing but renal pathology, like Heptenstall, for example, they always divide the discussion of diseases of the kidneys into three groups. And then we'll be dealing with the concepts of obstruction, obstruction to urine flow. And of course, tumors is always uh, discussed at the very end. So let's get going. Uh, there's always a little bit of uh, nice embryology we should remember. And uh, if you kind of remember from embryology, there's three aspects of embryologic development. Uh, going from the pro-nephros to the meso-nephros to the meta-nephros. Now, the pro-nephros you could forget about. It's a structure which deteriorates quickly. Generally, the uh, renal system develops from the cranial aspect caudally, but the pro-nephros quickly deteriorates and is no longer present in, in you know, live human beings. <clears throat> like, well, in embryos, of course. The uh, mesonephros gives rise to a part of the kidney uh, except for the nephrons themselves. So the actual kidney that we'll be dealing with is developed from both the mesonephros and the metanephros. Remembering that the human nephrons are a product of the metanephric system and the rest of the kidney is from mesonephric structures. This is a very good place to start, and I purposely kept the uh, right part of the slide blank because you all know what this is. Hopefully, you have all seen these. Hopefully, you've all cut through them. In fact, this is a good time to ask a question. How many of you have actually dissected a kidney and sliced the kidney in anatomy lab and looked at something like this? If you haven't, that's okay. If you if you haven't, I really appreciate you saying no. Okay, some people say never, some people say not yet, but probably uh, half of you have dissected a kidney. <clears throat> so this is what it is. It's 150 grams, just like the spleen, and exactly one-tenth of what the liver weighs. So that's a good thing to remember. Liver, spleen, kidneys, both kidneys, weigh 150, the spleen weighs 150, and the liver weighs 1,500 on the average. There's a, a wide array of arteries that branch from the main renal artery into the segments of the artery, and then curving around the cortical medullary junction, the arcuate arteries. And then you have arteries, which eventually will give rise to the uh, afferent arterioles. So Let's uh, put in the answers now to what we're looking at. Remembering that here's the renal vein, okay? Here is the renal artery. You can probably call uh, these structures here calyces. Now, there's usually a, a relatively small number of calyces, maybe three, four, five, six, and those correspond to the segments of embryologic development. So that's why the first branches of the main renal artery are called segmental arteries. They're the largest arteries coming from the renal. And of course, uh, branching from the segmental arteries are the interlobar arteries, okay? Now, when the interlobar arteries send branches along the cortical 
medullary junction arcing, so to speak, like this. That's why they're called the arcuate arteries. And of course, after the arcuate arteries, they uh, are interlobular now. So an interlobular artery is smaller than an interlobar because a lobar is bigger than a lobule. And from the uh, interlobular, you then will ultimately have the branches going to the afferent arteries and the glomerular tufts, and you know uh, what it's like from there. Um, just a point of uh, understanding is that once you have something called a renal pelvis and a major calyx and a minor calyx, these are all lined by transitional epithelium. So theoretically, tumors of this area would probably be chiefly transitional cell carcinomas, whereas tumors of the kidney that are before then in the renal cortex, for example, are a whole different type of carcinoma. You can call them an adenocarcinoma if you wish, because the tubules are actually glandular, but most people call them just renal cell carcinoma, or a lot of people call them clear cell carcinomas because the cells look pretty clear. Okay. Here we go again, and I want to remind you that we're going to start into the discussion of the classifications of renal diseases based on these three things, glomeruli, tubules, and blood vessels. The, uh, the business end of the kidney, where all of the action is, of course, is the glomerulus. So here you have the part of the glomerulus that's fed by the afferent artery, the glomerular tuft, so to speak, branching into all of these capillary loops. And of course, in this uh, transmission, I made a little error here, by the way. I'm sorry, this is a scanning electron microscopy over here. This is correct. This is a three-dimensional view, probably the nicest view of a glomerulus that you'll ever see. Here is the view of the glomerulus uh, as an individual capillary loop interfacing with podocytes or the epithelial foot processes. And of course, if you take, and there's the nucleus of an endothelial cell, you can see the capillary itself is fenestrated, has little holes in it. Now, the basal lamina, or the basement membrane between the fenestrated capillary processes and the foot processes is where all of the uh, disease called glomerulonephropathies take place. Because here we go. Here, you have to understand this is another really nice transmission electron microscopic view now. And you can see epithelial foot processes, you know, coming from the podocytes. They have a primary and a secondary and a tertiary branching. You have a totally uniform basement membrane, chiefly type 4 collagen. And then on the other side of the basement membrane, you have little interruptions in the cytoplasm of the endothelial cells called fenestrations. And these are the pores. So the little uh, uh, separations between the uh, endothelial cells and the little separations between the foot processes of the podocytes is the place where glomerular filtration takes place. And of course, the general rule is that just about anything that's not a protein could theoretically go through there. A lot of the stuff is reabsorbed, as you know. I'm not going to go into basic renal physiology. And uh, when we talk about glomerular nephropathies, we're going to really be talking about diseases that occur either in the basement membrane itself in the endothelium, you know, on the inside of the membrane or the uh, vascular side, or the foot processes of the podocytes on the epithelial side. Okay, now here's the world's best diagram as well. This is not an electron microscope. This is actually, I believe this is from Robin, so it's really an excellent picture. So we basically have identified two types of cells now in the uh, glomerulus. We talked about the endothelial cells. You can see a nice endothelial cell nucleus here. Here's the fenestrations. We talked about the podocytes. And if you want to call the podocytes visceral 
epithelium rather than the epithelial cells which uh, line the outside of the Bowman's capsule called the parietal epithelium. You could do that because often it's referred to as that. So there's your parietal epithelial cell, you know, lining the Bowman's capsule. There is the uh, visceral epithelial cell, also called the podocyte, having primary and secondary branches. And there's your nice, beautiful little basement membrane, very, very nicely separating the vascular side from the urinary side. The one cell that we have neglected now are the so-called mesangial cells. Mesangial cells are very common at the vascular tuft or the vascular pole of the glomerulus, more common than in the so-called urinary pole. But they are scattered throughout the glomerulus as well. They are actually derived from the same cell line as uh, monocytes or macrophages, but they are also very contractile. So they play a very, very key role in the regulation of uh, glomerular blood flow, not only in the juxtaglomerular apparatus area, but throughout the uh, uh, rest of the uh, glomerulus as well. But they're generally more common in the vascular top. So the point I'm trying to make is, is when you are looking at a, a glomerulus on light microscopy, which we are over here, you're going to say, gee, I can't tell what is what. How many different kinds of cells are there? Well, there's only three kinds of cells. All of the cells that you see in the glomerulus are either endothelial cells, podocytes, or mesangial cells. And if you see, for example, if you think this is probably... Uh, you know, uh, the vascular pole over here, maybe this is actually part of the uh, uh, zonula uh, densa. Probably a larger proportion of these cells are mesangial cells. Here you see a, a few parietal epithelial cells in the urinary pole. And otherwise, in all honesty, even with good microscopes, uh, and light microscopy, you cannot really tell the difference very well. So almost all of real, renal pathology or glomerular pathology is diagnosed uh, from uh, uh, electron microscopy. By the way, you see this nice little linear array of cells over here and over here? What do you think that is? Somebody want to give me a guess? Remember, it's a specialization of the distal convoluted tubule. Look, it's beautiful. You may or may not have seen that in histology. That's the macula densa, isn't it? Okay. Well, you don't really have to worry about the identifying individual cells. The only time I could really tell a cell for sure is when you see an open capillary loop, like maybe there. Uh, and you see a little bit of a nucleus kind of curving around it, then you know that that's probably an endothelial cell. But in all practical purposes, and light microscopy, you can't tell which is which. Okay. When we talk about liver disease, we'll talk about cirrhosis, and we'll talk about the uh, clinical aspects of cirrhosis. The end stage of all significant chronic renal diseases is the clinical entity of chronic renal failure. So let's get into some clinical features of the end stage of renal disease, no matter what the causes are. We'll be talking about a lot of causes. Okay, where should we start? I don't know how I got this list here. It may be from Robbins or I may have modified it, but basically you have severe fluid and electrolyte disturbances, obviously. You can have dehydration on the one hand, you could have edema on the other hand for a variety of reasons. Most renal failure results in hyperkalemia. And another thing you might remember, just you know, to keep in your pocket, is that usually going hand in hand with hyperkalemia is hypocalcemia. And that would explain a lot of the bone changes in a chronic renal failure as well. Because the kidney is failing, uh, it cannot regulate pH very well. So there's usually a metabolic acidosis as a cardinal feature of chronic renal failure. Uh, in bone and phosphate and calcium metabolism, the bottom line is not only hypocalcemia, 
but often hyperphosphatemia. Now think about it. If you have hypocalcemia, your parathyroids are going to uh, click in to try to uh, regulate that calcium, aren't they? So uh, probably a good portion, perhaps even the majority of patients with hyperparathyroidism are hyperparathyroid secondary to the hypocalcemia of renal failure rather than a parathyroid adenoma. So uh, let's say that significant, unexplained uh, hyper uh, uh, calcemia can be either due to a parathyroid adenoma or secondary hyperparathyroidism as a physiologic reaction to hypocalcemia. Now, renal osteodystrophy is not a single disease. You could probably define renal osteodystrophy as the sum total of all changes uh, found in bone secondary to these profound uh, phosphate and calcium disturbances. Chronic renal failure patients are usually anemic. The kidney makes erythropoietin. You have a diseased kidney. Erythropoietin is down. Red blood cell production is down. They also have a lot of bleeding diatheses. And uh, in the old days, we thought that this was generally due to small vessel friability, you know, but there's a wide variety of other reasons, not just uh, problems with platelets, but also even coagulation factors. So there's a lot of reasons why people with chronic renal failure have bleeding diatheses. Diseased ischemic kidneys result in hypertension. Hypertension itself can cause congestive heart failure, or you could have a congestive heart failure secondary to the renal effects even more directly. Congestive heart failure might promote pulmonary edema, and a uremic pericarditis is very, very common in patients with chronic renal failure. We used to do autopsies on patients with uh, renal failure. Uh, we always used to look for the pericarditis, sometimes the most significant whopping fibrinous pericarditis was secondary simply to the renal failure. In fact, I would probably venture to say that uh, of all the causes of pericarditis, probably renal failure is at the top of the list. In the gastrointestinal system, because of buildup of toxic substances, you know, urea, creatinine, which are normally killed by the kidney, you'll have a significant amount of nausea and vomiting. You know, you also have the bleeding secondary to the changes we talked about here. Patients with chronic renal failure get esophagitis, they get gastritis, and they get colitis. Now, isn't that interesting? Because embryologically, <clears throat> you know, the mucosa of the GI tract is uh, very similar to uh, the skin. So all of these inflammatory, irritative, toxic changes that you get within the gastrointestinal system are uh, uh, also manifested in the skin as well. People with renal failure have itchy skin. They have a lot of different types of dermatosis. And the one color that their skin is frequently uh, described as is this color called sallow. Now, if sallow to me is one of those words that, you know, doesn't really mean anything. I mean, I learned the name of a million colors when I was a kid, but sallow is kind of a greenish yellow. And if you're a uh, computer nut and you slide your RGB uh, scale up to 196, 145, 141, technically that's the best definition of a sallow. On the other hand, if you look at the name of the plant that the word sallow comes from, Salix capria, you can see that sallow is kind of a greenish yellow. So when you see a patient that doesn't really quite look jaundiced, but the skin looks a little bit yellower than usual, you can uh, probably guess that that person may be uh, in renal failure. Okay, good place to start before we get into our three major definitions are where we always start in Robbins regarding diseases, and those are the congenital diseases, the errors of development. Could you have somebody born without kidneys 
Of course, that's incompatible with life. That's called agenesis. Could you have somebody born with a much smaller kidney or kidneys than possible? Yeah, that's called hypoplasia by definition, from our classic definitions from day one, isn't it? Now, if you have a patient with hypoplastic kidney unilaterally, do you think possibly that the kidney on the other side might be a little bit bigger than normal? I was asking that as a question, just yes or no. <clears throat> and yeah, you, I kind of fed you the answer. What about an ectopic kidney? Kidneys uh, should nicely be kind of like a mirror image of each other. But what if one is significantly lower or displaced pretty far away from its neighbor? That's called an ectopic kidney. And almost all of the ectopic kidneys are way down in the pelvis. So very often the name of the uh, term pelvic kidney is almost synonymous with ectopic kidney. But technically you could have a kidney that's not where it's supposed to be and it's not in the pelvis. Kidneys that are fused in their poles, usually inferiorly, are called horseshoe kidneys for obvious reasons, because they look like horseshoes. So here's a genesis. This is an autopsy done on a, a probably a stillborn, premature. And I'm not showing you anything on the autopsy. I mean, the reason why the kidneys aren't there is the same reason that the baby could not live. So I'm not showing you a finding at an autopsy here. I'm showing you a lack of a finding. A genesis, complete absence of renal, uh, of kidneys, incompatible with life. Now, here's a hypoplasia, also dissected, possibly from a stillborn. Uh, you see something that is almost non-existent here on one side. I'm guessing this is right, but I guess it could be left. It's probably right. And then you have what looks like sort of a normal pattern here on the left. Uh, so if this baby was born, for example, with two normal kidneys, this kidney here would probably be a little bit smaller than it is now because we have obviously some degree of compensatory growth or you might use the term compensatory hypertrophy or hyperplasia by virtue of the fact that the kidney here is virtually absent or severely hypoplastic. Another thing I want to uh, show you is that you see this kidney here? It doesn't look quite totally smooth and uniform as a, an adult kidney. You can see it's almost like there's three or four little segments to it. I mean, you don't have to have much of an imagination. So usually when uh, children are born in fetuses, they have what they call fetal lobulation. And this is very normal. We've all had lobulated kidneys about the time we were born. And basically, these are just the segments which eventually fuse, you know, as you get older. Here's an ectopic kidney. Here's a diagram of an ectopic kidney in which you could see, you know, one kidney on one side uh, in the normal place, the renal artery just below the uh, uh, inferior mesenteric. And then you see a renal artery coming off of the iliac over here to produce another kidney, probably at the level of the pelvis. Now, when you do a bone scan, you know, which I did a million of in my life, and you see that there's a good collection of uh, dye or tracer or technetium phosphate compound to be more specific way down here in the pelvis you can suspect the pelvic kidney now on this uh, patient's right side you can see a little collection in the urinary uh, pelvis where there should be but down here and of course when a kidney is pelvic kidney do you think it's much more likely to be obstructed being in that abnormal location and I kind of fed you that answer, too. The answer is yes. So here is a pelvic kidney from the view, not of nuclear medicine or not of an artist's drawing, but of an actual IVP in which the collection of dye within the uh, calyces. And we looks like we have about five of them here. One, two, three, four, five. Whether there's physiologic obstruction or not, I wouldn't know. But you can see this kidney is all the way down almost almost touching the bladder as a matter of fact in the pelvis so i'm glad somebody mentioned here in the notes ectopic is highly associated with obstruction 
I think you know what a common thing this looks like. It looks like a horseshoe. In horseshoe kidneys, you have fusion, usually of the lower poles of the kidney. And here you have a nice dissection in which you see the ureters. And if you were to actually take a section through the lower portion of this horseshoe mass, it would look almost continuous. And look, here's an IVP. You can see most of the collecting system here is where it should be in the pelvis. But these structures even sort of blend in and concentrate much more in the lower pole. So uh, probably the collecting area of this kidney goes a little bit more inferiorly than it should be. But by the time you get down here in the lower part of the horseshoe, it's, it's pure kidney. Uh, horseshoe kidneys uh, are usually picked up. Uh, they're very often they're asymptomatic, uh, but they are associated with a greater amount of obstruction than normal kidneys. Okay. Now we'll deal with the concept of cystic diseases. Um, I have a question to ask you again. How many of you have actually uh, dissected kidneys or seen kidneys or observed kidneys in anatomy lab? I'm hoping a lot of you have, okay? But I know most of you. I have a, I'm seeing a lot of yeses here. So for all of you that said yes, let me ask you this. Was the kidney that you saw and dissected, was it 100% free of cysts? That's the question. And I'm getting no, 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 no. So the point I'm trying to make is cysts in kidneys, even in normal people or even in older people that die of other things, are very, 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 very common. They're frequently incidental. They may be called simple cysts, but there's also this wide variety of what we call cystic diseases. And uh, we're gonna be talking about the uh, classification of cystic diseases of the kidney, starting out with the term cystic renal dysplasia, and then going into the autosomal dominant variety AD, which stands for adults as well, the autosomal recessive. And as you know, autosomal recessive diseases usually appear quicker and they have better penetrance and appear earlier in life. So they're usually seen in children, whereas the autosomal dominant are usually seen in adults. And we'll talk about cysts uh, in the medulla and in the junction between the medulla and the cortex, what we call nephronophthisis medullary. Then we'll just be talking about the kind of cysts that you saw in animal lab, which are usually acquired cysts and uh, or simple cysts. For the most part, uh, synonymous. Okay, what's renal dysplasia? Well, first of all, it's a misnomer in kind of a way because everything we've talked about now in which we use the word dysplasia, we were usually referring to a, a changes in cells which preceded malignancy. Now, uh, in congenital uh, kidney diseases, though, it takes on a different meaning. In this case, sense, the word dysplasia doesn't mean uh, pre-malignant, but it means the growth has not been fully uh, properly displayed. In other words, kids that have renal dysplasia have enlarged kidneys. They're absolutely cystic. They can be unilateral or bilateral. And when I use the word dysplasia, I mean that normally mesenchyme differentiates into mature structures. But in this sense, there has been a disturbance of the growth dysplasia, let's say, in which when you look at these kidneys microscopically, there's still a lot of primitive uh, connective tissue, uh, mesenchymal tissue present. Uh, severely, you know, of course, it would be incompatible with life. So you'll see this in stillborns and newborns. Uh, generally speaking, there's a couple of genes uh, that you want, might want to remember. One of them is called a EYA1. And the other one is called a 6-1. I throw these genes in here only because, you know, uh, I don't want to give you additional things to memorize. But, you know, it's not beyond possibility that you just may have to have a vague recognition of these two genes and knowing that they have uh, been indicted 
uh, is being mutated in patients and uh, babies with cystic renal dysplasia. And of course, because the kidneys are uh, multiple cysts, they're cystic in configuration, they're enlarged. I guess you can call it multi-cystic as a definition. But now we'll be moving into the concept of what we call polycystic kidney. So the multiple cysts or multi-cystic appearance of renal dysplasia secondary to perhaps some mutations in EYA1 or SIX1 is different from the children that have classical polycystic kidney disease childhood type. So probably the best place to start is the adult type because that's where everybody starts. Let's talk about the adult, A-D-U-L-T, also autosomal dominant, and it is an autosomal dominant disease which means it may not have complete penetrance, uh, it may not be apparent at birth, and classically, autosomal dominant, or the adult type of polycystic kidney disease, it's hereditary, you know. We have families in which the PKD gene 1 or PKD2 gene have mutations, and it's not uh, a surprise that polycystic kidney disease would have mutated genes called PKD1 and 2. It follows the classical autosomal dominant pedigree, which means it doesn't skip generations. And because it's autosomal dominant, it's, it may not even be expressed uh, until later in life. It's not unusual for a, a man uh, in his 50s, uh, a person in their 50s, for example, to all of a sudden go into unexplained renal failure. Uh, and they realize that they have been born with polycystic kidney disease. Their kidneys worked really good up until about age 50. And then bingo, all of a sudden they're in renal failure. And very often by that time, they realize that they've already had children as well. And then they may realize perhaps that their fathers died of renal disease too. Of course, there's ways of uh, identifying that gene now uh, genetically, and uh, this type of scenario doesn't occur as often as it can. But remember, this is a classical autosomal dominant disease produced by mutations in PKD, polycystic kidney disease one and two. It's also classical autosomal dominant, which means may not express itself early, and uh, uh, the clinical presentation uh, could be either sex, but more likely a man. I don't know why that, uh, even though it's not sex linked, that will appear as a renal failure in the middle or slightly beyond middle life. Now, here's the autosomal recessive. Autosomal dominant was adults, autosomal recessive. Autosomal recessive diseases in, in general, if you remember, are in kids because they appear early in life, there's usually full penetrance, and uh, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease is a disease of children. Now, do they, is there any way that these kidneys, for example, could be differentiated grossly or microscopically from the adult polycystic kidney disease? Probably not, other than the fact that, uh, you know, they're smaller kidneys and they're in kids. The gene involved, Rather than PKD for adults, it's now we're called PKHD for children. And the interesting thing about this disease is that even if uh, these uh, kids can survive uh, childhood with this disease, they very often develop hepatic fibrosis too. So even if they have you know good transplants and you know, they're going along, they may wind up having a lot of fibrosis in their liver. <clears throat> something to possibly remember. Now, what about uh, cysts in the medullary portions of the kidney, microscopic cysts or small cysts? Now, you know, when you look at a sponge closely, you don't usually see big, large holes. You see just kind of a small, spongy texture to it. Well, this is your so-called medullary sponge kidney. The radiologists like to use the term 
MSK, medullary sponge kidney, because a lot of times they're picked up incidentally on CD or ultrasound. We see a lot of little cysts. Now, of course, this is not a CT or ultrasound. This is a gross specimen. And if you have seen a lot of kidneys in your life, you know that there is generally a pretty good demarcation between cortex and medulla. And then you have your renal columns between there. But take a, a close look here. Maybe I could even make it a little bit bigger. I don't know. See, these are a bunch of tiny little cysts. They're all like maybe a millimeter or two. That's why I call it the sponge kidney. It's not always associated with severe renal disease, uh, but it can be. And, oh, perhaps when you look at the... Uh, uh, dye CT, for example, you might see more of a prominence of the medulla and perhaps a secondary thinning of the cortex. A disease which is related to this, but the cysts are predominantly at the uh, cortical medullary junction rather than throughout the entire medulla, is a disease called nephronophistis. Okay, so the cysts are still here. They're at the cortomedically, cortical medullary junction. It's a hereditary disease as well. It's autosomal recessive, which means it's a disease of kids, right? You see autosomal recessive, you think kids. And uh, it's a progressive disease. It usually does result in renal failure, whereas the medullary sponge kidney uh, very often does not in, uh, result in renal failure. Okay. It's also been noted that patients that are on dialysis for any reason very often uh, develop acquired cysts. And uh, it doesn't mean that the dialysis caused it. I suspect that the reasons that they are getting dialysis may be a factor instead. And these cysts are called uh, acquired cysts. Here's one in which they're relatively small and multiple. And Generally, they often just may be uh, single. They're usually in the cortex. They also have the name retention cysts. They are also inquired. They're usually asymptomatic. They're very often filled with fluid, and they are very, 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 very common. And once again, I'm not going to ask you the question again, but I can remember a few years ago, I was going through every dissection uh, in the anatomy lab with the students as an anatomy instructor, not as a pathologist. And it was very, very hard to find a kidney that did not have some type of cyst in it. The, the explanation for why simple cysts are so common, especially in older people, is the, the rationale is that if there is an obstruction to the uh, tubules or collecting system, almost at any le level, it's going to result as a blockage in a secondary cyst. That's the rationale, and that's uh, probably the uh, reason why, you know, the older you get, the more likely you are to have some type of obstruction at some level of your kidney, and therefore a secondary cyst. Okay. Now, why am I showing you this picture again? I'm showing you this picture again is because we are now going to be going into a huge discussion on uh, the three types of classical renal diseases after we cleared away things like the cysts and the congenital diseases. There's three kinds of kidney diseases, glomerulonephropathies, diseases of tubules, and diseases of blood vessels. And that's where we're going to go. Let's see what time it is. It's 8.51. Oh, I think we could probably get into the glomerulars a little bit before we take our break. So what is a glomerulonephropathy? A glomerulonephropathy is any disease of a glomerulus, okay? Now, is a glomerulonephropathy the same as a glomerulonephritis? Well, not exactly, but a, a glomerulonephritis is not a classical type of inflammatory disease like we think of in general. Like we think of inflammatory diseases in general. We think of, you know, infiltrates of neutrophils for acute inflammation, infiltrates of uh, chronic inflammatory cells, lymphocytes, or uh, macrophages for chronic inflammatory diseases. Very often the nephritides of the glomeruli do not really always result in infiltrates of inflammatory cells. That they may very well uh, 
just be manifested in a whole bunch of abnormal changes along the basement membrane and on the one side of the basement membrane known as the podocytes and the other side of the glomerular basement membrane known as the uh, endothelium. So uh, I'll tell you, even in pathology residents and even in pathologists, when you use the term glomerulonephropathy, it often evokes kind of a, a, a dread because the, the, very often they're seen as very complex and hard to understand. And this is why I hated this chapter originally. So what I've done is kind of overhauled it and I'm going to go into the general features of glomerulonephropathies in general, and then talk about the five or six common ones. And you must be able to differentiate, you know, clinically and every other way, the different types of glomerulonephropathies, uh, at least the common ones. But here are the things that are pretty much in common to all the glomerulonephropathies in terms of their clinical expression. You notice that the first and the third one have this name nephrotic syndrome in it. Okay, the nephrotic syndrome can appear very acutely. Okay, this is a clinically acute nephrotic syndrome occurring, boom, somebody who never had it, or it could appear very slowly. So one of the clinical manifestations is an acute nephrotic syndrome. And that's probably more likely than a chronic nephrotic syndrome, but nephrotic syndrome in itself, which we're gonna define shortly, is almost always indicative of some type of glomerulonephropathy, either primarily or secondarily. You can have another type of glomerulonephritis, which is called rapidly progressive and that's not a specific anatomic entity it's also a clinical manifestation in other words it's the symptoms of glomerulonephritis but it is very 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 serious it very often results in you know renal failure and even death within a few months and uh, it is not a specific anatomic change it could be a feature to any type of glomerulonephritis that is uncontrolled and rapid. Of course, you can have a chronic renal failure type of picture as well. Somebody that may take weeks, months, years to actually get progressively failing kidneys through all the usual ways you measure renal function. On the other hand, some of the glomerulonephropathies may result in very, very minimal type clinical changes. You may have a asymptomatic hematuria which means a microscopic hematuria because uh, you can't see it as, it doesn't take much blood to color the normally yellow urine pink. So an asymptomatic hematuria uh, may be still looking clear with just a few red blood cells and they can only measure by the dipstick method or other changes, or asymptomatic proteinuria, a small amount of protein uh, that is asymptomatic. Now. This is the best sort of clinical scenario. But when you have a massive amount of proteinuria, usually more than about three grams a day, for example, then you get into this syndrome we call nephrotic syndrome. So just remember, these are the overall general clinical presentations of people with glomerulonephropathies. Now, what are the general pathologic features that we see in the glomeruli of people with glomerulonephropathies. Well, because the glomerulonephropathies are often called glomerulonephritides as well, itis, you can see cellular proliferations, you can see mesangial cell proliferations, you can see endothelial cell proliferations, you can see your regular old neutrophil or leukocyte infiltrations. Now, when we, uh, if we were in the situation where we had this so-called rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis picture, you want to see specific anatomic changes in those glomeruli called crescents. 
So when you see the term or hear the term in the pathology or crescent, they're talking about clinically a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, which is very, very often fatal. The key place to look for disease changes in any glomerulonephropathy or glomerulonephritis is the basement membrane. You may have a lumpy kind of a thickening of the basement membrane rather than being, it being uniform in density and uniform in thickness. You may have little spikes present throughout the glomerular basement membrane, or if the changes are chronic enough, like any chronic inflammatory process might eventually result in fibrosis, in which your entire glomerulus can look like scar tissue, because it is. So the chronic glomerulonephropathies, in which there's been long-standing damage and changes and secondary deposition of uh, collagen by fibroblasts, uh, usually the term hyalinization is used to describe these glomeruli, or sclerosis, okay? So these are the common pathologic manifestations. Now, depending on what the specific changes are, may very well determine the type or the classification of the glomerulonephritis. And we're not going to get into those yet. We're going to get into them very, very soon. What about the general overall common features of the glomerulonephropathies, the glomerulonephritides? Well, very often you'll see antibodies against the glomerular basement membrane. And if you remember, glomerular basement membrane, like most basement membranes, is type 4 collagen. Would you expect a patient with a glomerulonephropathy in which they're making antibodies against their glomerular basement membrane? You Would you expect that to be an antibody against type 4 collagen? Absolutely. Sometimes they have antibodies against antigens that were planted in or around the glomerular basement membrane. Now, this probably, this third one, I should probably make a little bit bigger of a font because I want to explain something to you. Do you remember we talked about uh, type 3 hypersensitivity? We said that type 3 hypersensitivities were characterized by circulating antigen antibody complexes. Well, I want to tell you something. When you have circulating antigen antibody complexes anywhere in your body from any type of disease, whether it's autoimmune or not, and they're usually autoimmune, the glomerular basement membrane is a magnet. It is a sponge for circulating antigen antibody complexes. And keep that in mind because a lot of the glomerulonephropathies are due to the simple fact that the glomeruli love to suck in antigen antibody complexes. Let me just ask you a question out of curiosity. I don't know if you knew that or not, but let me ask you another question. Uh, can anybody kind of recall another part of the body that is a magnet for antigen antibody complexes? In fact, two parts. Well, somebody said lung. That could be sometimes. Somebody said spleen. Somebody said liver. Somebody said eye. Ah, there you go. Somebody said joints. Yes, the synovium is another magnet for antigen antibody complexes. And somebody said skin as well. And uh, as you know, generally blood vessels are also, the walls of blood vessels, even more logically, are also magnets for circulating, you know, type 3 hypersensitivity antigen antibody complexes. Okay, so what, what, are, what are we basically saying so far in the pathogenesis of many or most of the glomerulonephritides? In almost every case, we're talking about antibodies, right? We're talking about trapped antigen antibody complexes. We're talking about antibodies against basement membrane. We're talking about antibodies against antigens which were planted there and they're not normally adhering to it. Now, we can even tell you 
that we could have antibodies against glomerular cells, against mesangial cells, against podocytes. So what are we saying is that we're saying that uh, glomerular nephropathies are basically characterized by antibodies reactions against uh, crucial parts of the glomeruli. But not to neglect cellular immunity, okay? Very often you will see sensitized T cells, okay, that are also attacking the glomerulus at very levels. So these are, this is the common pathogenesis of most of the glomerular nephropathies. And, you know, maybe I want you to keep this image in mind as well. This one's an actual, you know, very nice high level glomerular basement membrane, a drawing. And you can see the podocytes on one side. And look how they have nice little sits, slits, nice little filtration slits between the podocytes. And look how, and the uh, capillary lumen level, you can see the fenestrations in the capillaries. They almost look like a mirror image, except the podocytes are a little bit denser, aren't they? So this is the battleground. This is the war zone where you have your glomerular nephropathies. It's at the precise location where glomerular filtration takes place between the fenestra of the capillaries and the filtration slits of the podocytes in this uniform, thin, nice, normal basal lamina. So when you go into the various types of glomerular nephropathies now, which we're going to do, you can remember that most of the changes, you could probably pinpoint almost every single one in terms of where the abnormality is going to be. Is it going to be in the foot processes? Is it going to be fusion? Is it going to be thinning? Is it going to be lumps or bumps in the basement membrane? Is it going to be spikes? Is it going to be trapped complexes? So if you just kind of memorize this now, not the words, but the image, okay? If you just kind of keep this in mind, this is the classification of all the glomerular nephropathies, which is basically one third or more of all kidney diseases. Should we give you this last one or not? Yeah, we might as well, because we've been introducing the concept now, and this will be the last concept before we go into the specific glomerular nephropathies. What are the cellular mediators? Well, the cellular mediator of almost any type of inflammation is neutrophils. So in some of the glomerular nephropathies, you'll see neutrophils. And that's obvious because inflammation means neutrophils. In many of them, the predominant inflammatory cell may be a monocyte or a macrophage. As you know, they're the same thing. Uh, you may have sensitized T cells. Uh, where they shouldn't be in the glomerulus. You may have natural killer cells. You may see a conglomeration of platelets. You may see an, an increased number of mesangial cells. Because remember, mesangial cells are very closely related to the monocytes or macrophages. They're in the same family. But in many of the glomerular nephropathies, these are increased as well. And of course, the soluble factors, the general soluble factors of inflammation, like various cytokines, chemokines, coagulation factors. You know, these are all considered to be major players in this little uh, epic, in this classification of battles now, of battles, fields, which we're going to show you called glomerular nephropathies. And I can see it's already past the hour. So let's take our 10-minute break. I think, the, uh, I think the sound that you hear during our... Uh, the music during the break is going to be better than we heard at the beginning. And then we'll come back in about 10 minutes. I think I'll go get myself another little cup of coffee. Uh, and I'll, uh, we'll discuss the big topic of specific glomerular nephropathies. See you in 10 minutes, folks.
Well, we are back, <clears throat> and uh, I can tell from some of your responses that during the break that the music got a little bit better uh, towards the end. Is that true? Did the uh, music start out crummy during the break, but then got a little bit better? <clears throat> That's the question. Okay, but it's, was it as good as the music that we heard from Chicago, or was it still not really great music, but it was better? Okay, that's what I thought. Well, you know, I don't have a subwoofer here. It's not as good as my home stereo system. So at least it's something I hope that you enjoyed. <clears throat> and we'll see how it uh, sounded when I actually make the movie. Uh, we're back, and, you know, I always have one or two thoughts during the break, and... Uh, the, what I realized during the break when I went out to, you know, recycle my coffee is that I'm actually a little bit nervous today. And I don't normally get nervous when I do these things. Usually it's great joy. Um, I was feeling really good about the fact that, uh, you know, the chapter itself is a lot better than it used to be, especially when you see now we're going to be going into the glomerular nephropathies. But... Um, what made me nervous is that there were a couple of technical things at the beginning, like my inability to show all of the lecture notes and the fact that we have a new location and the fact that we have a different type of computer and a different type of sound. So I'm actually more nervous about the technology things than the actual medical aspects. So I don't know if you picked it up in my voice or not. I still have a little bit of a cold, so you may hear me clear my throat every now and then. But I feel that unless you admit your deepest innermost feelings to your students so you're not going to be uh, too much of a success so if, if you, i think if you're nervous which i was at, at least in the first part you should at least admit it and then i know that you'll probably cut me a little bit more slack okay but we know that the voice is working well even though the music wasn't and uh, i answered a few questions during the break and now there's a few more recent questions which i see which are going to be uh, <clears throat> coming up as we talk about the glomerular nephropathies. So let's get going. The first type of glomerular nephropathy, in this case also glomerular nephritis, is what we now call acute glomerular nephritis. That means it occurs acutely, usually in children, and usually uh, following a strep infection by, oh, let's say a couple of weeks, maybe a little bit less. Um, and because it's a glomerulonephritis in which there's damage to the glomerular basement membrane of some type, uh, you can expect to see some leakage of blood through the glomerulo glomerular basement membrane hematuria, leakage of protein, perhaps, through that same membrane, uh, some rise in the BUN and creatinine or azotemia in general, as well as some degree of oliguria in which the kidneys are basically not putting out much urine at all. Now, the old term for acute glomerulonephritis is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. We don't call it that anymore, but some people still do. And that's because, uh, etiologically, it follows the strep infection. When you look at the glomeruli of these kids that have it, they're generally hypercellular. So you're thinking maybe there's an infiltrate of inflammatory cells. And yes, there actually is. You have some increase in the mesangial cells, if you want to consider them also to be sort of like 
the macrophages of the glomerulus, and some increase in your endothelial cells as well. So that's the chief reason for the hypercellularity. And um, what we see in acute so-called post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis is deposition of immunoglobulins, both IgG and IgM, along the glomerular basement membrane. And also complement as well. Okay, so these are the three things you want to look for. Now, of course, you can't see them on light microscopy, and you probably can't really see them on electron microscopy either. So all of these uh, uh, biopsies are sent out for immunofluorescence, and they actually make antibodies against IgG or fluorescent antibodies against IgM or fluorescent antibodies against complements, just to show that these are the three things which are actually being deposited along the glomerular basement membrane. <clears throat> now, I want you to remember this word, bumpy, okay? In fact, we're going to make the word bumpy even bigger. Because classically, the uh, deposition of immunoglobulin and complement in the glomerular basement membrane is deposited in a lumpy, bumpy fashion. In other words, the membrane is not uniform. You see a bump here, a globule over here. It's irregular, it's focal, and it's bumpy. And the reason why I want to tell you that that word bumpy is important when you look at it is because unlike the other common type of glomerulonephritis, what we call membranous, which we'll be getting into, they're deposited in a spike-like fashion. So the one thing that all of our medical students like always kind of kept in their mind is that lumpy bumpy means post-streptococcal or acute glomerulonephritis, whereas spiky definite depositions usually mean membranous. But we're not going to get into membranous. I mean, clinically, 95% of the kids recover. Uh, uh, thank God. And eventually these lesions will uh, resolve as well. So acute, acute glomerulonephritis or sensitization by strep antigens resulting in deposition along the basement membrane is the feature pathologically of acute glomerulonephritis. Recovery, 95% of the time, full recovery is the clinical feature. Now, you may not have seen a million glomeruli in your lifetime, but let me ask you this. I know a lot of you, we've seen, we've been looking at glomeruli all day in one way or another. Can you appreciate the fact that these glomeruli are hypercellular? Yes or no? Yeah, there's a lot more dots in them. And remember, I told you if you see dots inside of a glomerulus, it's going to be either one endothelial cell, two a podocyte, or three a mesangial cell. So you don't really know what kind of cells these are, but you know there's increased ones. And if you were to go on high power, you can see there's probably not many neutrophils, even though you may think there are from looking at it at this power. They're basically mononuclear cells, and they're probably mesangial cells, and they're probably endothelial cells. Now, Let's say that we took these glomeruli and we blew up one of them. And rather than staining it with hematoxylin and eosin, which is basically no good for renal biopsy interpretation, you now stain them with fluorescent antibodies against IgG, IgM, or complement. And bingo, whenever you see something light up like that, you know that you are having deposition of immunoglobulin in the glomerulus. And look, here is a transmission electron microscope, okay? And you can see a capillary loop over here, can't you? And you can see what well, looks to me like it's probably the nucleus of a podocyte over here. And you can see this endothelium on the inner side of the capillary loop. What is that? It's a lump. It's a bump. Look at it. There's a lump. There's a bump. There's a bump. There's a bump. There's a big bump. These are the deposits of immunoglobulin and complement. That's why if you want to think of the clinical disease in terms of a pathologic description in three words or four or five, think of it as lumpy, bumpy,
basement membrane thickenings. And remember, in our, in our concept, in our mind, like we saw over here, we always remembered that the basement membrane has to be uniform in thickness and uniform in density. Well, look, this basement membrane here is not uniform. It's lumpy and bumpy. Okay, now just to make me feel better and uh, make my anxiety a little bit less, can you see the lumps and the bumps? <clears throat> it's very, very likely some, way, some uh, creature from the AUSMLE may decide to throw this at you. Okay, now let's talk about another concept. Remember, this is not a pathologic entity. This is a clinical entity. So when I say the word rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, it means it could be just about any type of glomerulonephritis, including post-reptococcal. But clinically, it's rapidly progressive. So rapidly progressive is a clinical definition, not a specific pathologic one. However, in rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, clinically, you are very, very, very likely to see what we call crescents. You see this little moon over here? It looks like a bunch of inflammatory cells or perhaps epithelial cells kind of plastered along the urinary pole of the glomerulus. Look, there's the glomerular tuft where the blood vessels are coming in and out. There is the Bowman's space. There is the uh, parietal cells. And it looks like in the urinary pole, not the vascular pole, but the urinary pole of the glomerulus, you have a collection of all of these cells. Okay, well, what are they? Well, uh, they're predominantly uh, of monocytic origin. Uh, they also may have anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies along them if it was from a process in which the basement membrane was the primarily attack. They also may have immune complexes. They also may have uh, anti-neutrophil antibodies as well. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis clinically is a very, very, very serious disease. Okay? And it's not a specific pathologic entity. It's something that may occur clinically with a variety of different types of glomerulonephritides. Now, we've been neglecting one of the key features, one of the key clinical features of glomerulonephritis, and that's the nephrotic syndrome. So what does nephrotic syndrome mean? It means there's primarily a glomerulonephropathy going on. The key clinical feature of the nephrotic syndrome is massive proteinuria. Not just a little bit on the urine dipstick, but I'm talking about like several grams per day. Uh, I went to uh, one of Dr. Ramsey's presentations last week and it was excellent and he just had like a lot of really good features on this clinical feature unfortunately i'm not going to be as good as he is but i will tell you the majority of the protein that's leaking out through the glomerulus is albumin so that's why hypoalbuminemia is the second big feature of the nephrotic syndrome not only is it leaking out from the blood, but it's getting into the urine. And because it is leaking out of the blood, you now have a loss in the oncotic pressure in your vascular system. When you have a loss of oncotic pressure due to loss of albumin, due to the fact that you're losing it in the urine, you now have edema. And it could be very, very significant edema as well. And it's generalized. Sometimes it's very, very obvious around the eyes, orbital edema or periorbital edema is often attributed to a renal uh, diseases, nephrotic syndrome. Okay, now here's something that's a little bit mysterious, but it happens all the time. Your body is not as stupid as you think. <clears throat> now, I don't know if there's a specific mechanism known, but when your body knows that you're losing your oncotic pressure due to loss of albumin, it makes up for it 
by making more lipids. Now, lipids are not as good as albumin as being an agent for maintaining oncotic pressure, but they're a little bit good. So as a result, these patients have tremendous lipidemia and lipiduria as well. Okay, so now they are lipidemic as well. Now remember, the nephrotic syndrome is not due to any specific type of glomerulonephropathy. It could be present in a wide variety of glomerulonephropathies. Okay, now the three types of glomerulonephropathies that it's classically present in, which we haven't discussed yet, is membranous glomerulonephritis, minimal change glomerulonephritis. This was also called lipoid because of the fact that it frequently resulted in nephrotic syndrome with hyperlipidemia, but now it's called minimal change. And also a type of glomerulonephritis that's on the rise is possibly being one of the most common causes for nephrotic syndrome in adults, and that's focal segmental. So even though this may not look too important, can I tell you something? This is important. These are the three biggest causes, without a doubt, the three biggest types of glomerulonephropathies that result in nephrotic syndrome. Also, the nephrotic syndrome can be seen with other types of glomerulonephropathies. You know, we have to put amyloid in there, a collection of immune proteins in the glomeruli. Uh, various types of uh, renal diseases due to systemic lupus also associated with a wide variety of drugs. I wish I could give you a list of the top three, but there are a lot of drugs that have been attributed to nephrotic syndrome, as well as our regular old diabetes as well. So you kind of should remember these four, but these are the three you should really remember. So now that we've talked about membranous glomerulonephritis as being one of the biggest causes of nephrotic syndrome in adults, Let's talk about it as a disease in itself. Probably the majority of cases of membranous glomerulonephritis are what we call primary or idiopathic, which means they're not secondary to anything. And we don't really know what's causing it. But the one thing that is common to all membranous glomerulonephritis, whether they're idiopathic or secondary to a variety of drugs or patients with tumors or patients with a lot of circulating antigen antibody complexes or patients with a wide variety of different infections is the deposition of antigen antibody complexes. Remember we said that the glomerular basement membrane is a magnet for circulating antigen antibody complexes. Well, whether you have those uh, with drugs, with tumors, with lupus or other autoimmune diseases or with infections, their deposition in the glomerular basement membrane produces a picture called membranous glomerulonephritis. Now, we use the word indolent, which means uh, usually not fatal, usually not serious, even though most of the patients can recover from this, you know, steroids, and other treatments, perhaps immunosuppressives. Um, uh, more than half of them still have a little bit of persistent proteinuria, okay, which go in. And, 15% of all the patients with membranous go to the nephrotic syndrome. So it's a big, big, big cause. Let's look at membranous here. <clears throat> Here's a fluorescent stain against antigen antibody complexes. And as you could guess, it's all over the glomerulus. Now, usually almost all the glomerulonephritides are not very, very easily detected on regular old light h and &E microscopy. But sometimes these basement membranes are so thick they may lick, they may look the cap they may make the capillary loops look thinner than normal, or what they might call like a wire loop, like you see here, simply because there's so much deposition in the basement membrane. But I don't think any pathologist, and certainly no renal pathologist, would ever diagnose a membrane simply on the basis of a glomerulus that looks like this. You always have to get transmission, electron microscopy, and immunofluorescence for any 
suspected glomerulonephropathy. Now here's a diagram here in which you could see these sort of spiky, remember, they're not quite as lumpy and bumpy. Do you see how they send out these little tiny processes here, like here and here and here and here and here? Do you see how this has more of a spiky appearance? Yeah, so here, let me, let me ask you the, the key question. What does lumpy bumpy mean? Tell me the definition what is present when you have a glomerular amazement mirror that's lumpy and bumpy. <clears throat> it's post strep, isn't it? What kind of glomerular nephritis results in these depositions of antigen antibody complexes when they have a spike like feature? That's membranous. Now, I know that there are some of you out there that are very honest and you're saying, well, yeah, I can see that there's spikes along here, but there's also kind of a lumpiness to it as well. Well, remember when we saw post strep or what we called acute glomerulonephritis, all of those little lumps did not have the little spikes coming from them. So that's the key feature of the uh, probably two most common types of glomerulonephritis, lumpy bumpy and the basement membrane is post strep. Spikes are membranous. Okay. There's another type of uh, glomerulophobe nephritis in kids. Okay. In fact, it's the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. It's called minimal change. And that's a pathologic description because there are very minimal changes in the basement membrane itself. Instead, ra rather than having a, a basement membrane that's lumpy or bumpy, you see the basement membrane here? This is a normal basement membrane, by the way. You can see it's uniform in thickness. You can see it's uniform in density. You can see nice foot processes on one side and endothelial, uh, a fenestrated endothelium on the other side. That's normal. But look at this. Do you see how the foot processes on this side look like they're kind of fused or what we call effaced they're thin they're fused and this is called minimal change because it's not nearly as drastic of a deposition in the uh, basement membrane as the other ones it was also called a lipoid nephrosis in the older days i don't think any of the renal doctors are using that expression too much anymore but they still put it in and the key pathologic feature with minimal change, glomerulonephritis, is simply effacement of the foot processes. And it's the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in kids. So let's do a little review now. So we are never ever in fear of glomerulonephritis again. Acute post-streptococcal, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. What's the key? pathologic feature. Write it down. You got it. Membranous glomerulonephritis. What's the key pathologic feature? Okay, good. Spikes. You got them all. You're so smart. Third one, minimal change. What's the key pathologic feature? Right, the fusion of the foot processing. Now, you know, I, I can guarantee you that if you are asked any type of renal uh, situation on the board exams and it results in you having to look at an electron microscope, don't freak out. Just find that basement membrane and ask yourself three questions. Is it, lump, is it normal or is it lumpy and bumpy or is it spiky or is there a fusion of the foot processes? And that's like about the vast majority of most of the glomerulonephritides. Now, we cannot uh, neglect Another very, very, very common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults is called focal segmental. And by the way, it's a very, very, very appropriate name because fo the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, okay, sclerosis means deposition of fibrous tissue. It's focal. Look at here's the glomerulus. There's some fibrous tissue here. This is a trichrome stain. There's some fibrous tissue here. There's not much around here at all. It's focal and it's segmental. 
And remember, this is called glomerulosclerosis, not glomerulonephritis, okay? These are very, very common in HIV patients. They're also seen with heroin abusers. They're also seen with sickle cell patients. They're often seen in patients that are extremely obese. The thing to remember about focal segmental is that it used to be probably the second most common cause of nephrotic syndrome. Now a lot of people are saying it's the most common cause of adult nephrotic syndrome. So we have membranous and focal segmental being without a doubt the two most common causes in adults for nephrotic syndrome. And what's the most common cause in a kid? Let it rip. I'm expecting an answer. Yeah, it's minimal change, isn't it? Okay. Another type of glomerulonephritis, and by the way, we're almost at the end, is called membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, or if you want to call it MPGN, you know, like the renal pathologists do. Uh, it can also be idiopathic, like membranous, but very often it's frequently uh, secondary to chronic immune diseases, and hepatitis C is always at the top of the list. So a glomerulonephritis picture in a hepatitis C patient or HIV patient, you have to consider membranoproliferative. And like a lot of the other glomerulonephropathies, you'll see glomerular basement membrane alterations uh, and subendothelial uh, damages, but you'll see a lot of leukocytes here as well. So isn't that kind of strange that we've been discussing glomerul glomerulonephropathies? And finally, we found one that has what we call a classical inflammatory cell, which is a leukocyte, okay? The thing to remember about membranoproliferative is that it also has prominent mesangial involvement as well. And what does that mean? Increased in mesangial cells. Okay, question. Can you tell that this glomerulus is uh, increased in cellularity? You don't have to say what kind of cell. Now, it, you may find some neutrophils as being the increase, but probably the predominant cell for membranoproliferative mesangial. And what disease is at the top of the list here? Hepatitis C. Remember, we talked about alpha-1 antitrypsin as well, HIV, and a lot of tumors in general. That's membranoproliferative. So in every type of glomerulonephritis clinical situation that we talk about, I want you to remember the precise anatomic change, even if it's an electron microscopy, okay? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, when Dr. Manarsic talked about post-reptococcal, he said that there was a lot of IgM and a lot of IgG, but he didn't say IgA. What if I was to tell you that there is a specific type of glomerulonephropathy called IgA nephropathy? It's also called Berger's disease, but don't get that confused with the blood vessel thromboangiitis obliterans, Berger's disease with the U. This is B-E-R-G-E-R. And uh, this is kind of an interesting disease because usually it follows just like about a day or two after an upper respiratory infection. And remember we said the post-reptococcal might be like a couple of weeks, but with Berger's disease, it's, it could be like one or two days. And it can result in damage to the uh, basement membrane and therefore proteinuria. But the key pathologic feature, and it, you kind of can tell just from the name itself in IJ nephropathy, is deposits of immunoglobulin A. Not so much in the basement membrane, although there could be basement membrane damage. Otherwise, you wouldn't have proteinuria, right? But in the mesangium. So you see these cells here? These are mesangial cells. It looks like that they are a little bit fatter and thicker than normal. Looks like they might have depositions of something. Well, that's IgA. So think of IgA nephropathy uh, immediately following a, a URI by a couple days, and you do the immunofluorescent stain with an antibody directed against 
immunoglobulin A. And look, you see it. And do you see how, I'm assuming this is probably the vascular pole of the kidney here, and this is probably the urinary pole because it looks a little bit more open. But do you see how it's concentrating in the areas where the mesangial cells are generally more common, like towards the uh, vascular pole? So what's the key feature in Berger disease? Ig is Ig deposits in the mesangium. Okay. It wouldn't be fair if we didn't say a couple of words now about the uh, hereditary hematuria syndromes. All of the glomerulonephropathies we've been talking about now have been acquired. But you should know there is a specific syndrome. We mentioned this before when we were talking about collagen disorders. We said that there is a disease or syndrome called Alport syndrome. It's associated with progressive renal failure. But for some strange reason, it's also associated with ear and eye disorders too. A wide variety of eye and ear disorders, as a matter of fact. But the key feature in Alport syndrome is a hereditary disease, a genetic disease, in which you have a defective type of collagen 4. And as you know, collagen 4, we say collagen 4 is on the floor. So collagen 4 is basement membrane. Another hereditary hematuria syndrome is what we call thin glomerular basement membrane disease. And I'll tell you, unless you were like an experienced renal pathologist with a ruler, if I was to show you the glomerular basement membrane of somebody with thin glomerular basement membrane disease, you would probably call it normal. That's because in thin glomerular basement disease, it's uniform in thickness, it's uniform in density. It's only about as half as thick as it could be, as it should be because of defective, a genetic defect in the glomerular basement membrane. Okay, what that exact defect is or the gene, I'm sorry, I didn't look it up. I don't think I would expect to make you suffer through memorizing that either. And what about the concept of chronic glomerulonephritis? Most of the glomerulonephritis, glomerulonephropathies that we've talked about so far were acute. And uh, the term chronic glomerulonephritis is just about any of the previously described acute glomerulonephritis that have been going on for some time. And as you know, we talk about chronic inflammation in general. We often talk about uh, lymphocytes and macrophages ultimately replacing neutrophils. You know, that's basically the differentiation between acute and chronic inflammatory diseases. But we also say that in chronic diseases, we also have a lot of fibroblast and collagen deposition present. So no matter what the specific acute glomerulonephropathy was or glomerulonephritis, you may have thin cortices grossly in the kidney simply because the glomeruli are scarred down. And when you look at a glomerulus, it looks like it should be a glomerulus, but rather than seeing, you know, your cellular array of mesangial cells and endothelial cells and podocytes, you're actually seeing the whole glomerulus is scarred. Those are called hyalinized or fibrotic glomeruli. And it's not surprising that you would see these in dialysis patients because no matter what the reason is, or a patient to be receiving dialysis, you know his glomeruli, for the most part, may be chronically damaged and therefore hyalinized or fibrotic. Remember we said fibrous tissue or collagen is one of the forms of hyalin, so to speak. Okay, we're gonna suffer you through the very, very last PowerPoint now on this hopefully not so mysterious topic of glomerulonephritis or glomerulonephropathies. And uh, so far, almost all of the glomerulonephritis that we talked about were primary pathologic diseases of glomeruli. But you should be well aware, and I, I highlighted what I think is the top three. You should be well aware of the fact there are a variety of other diseases which result in a secondary type of glomerulonephropathy. Without a doubt, diabetes is at the top of the list in terms of frequency. You see a glomerular sclerosis that's nodular, 
that's also called chemistyle Wilson disease. That's almost uh, pathognomonic for diabetes. Amyloidosis, deposition of the immune proteins throughout the glomerular. Sometimes they can even totally hyalinize them. That's another secondary type of glomerulonephritis. And by the way, I get a typo there, don't I? Even after all these years, I still get typos all the time. Systemic lupus, due to the fact that it has a variety of circulating uh, antigen antibody complexes can be sucked in by the glomerular basement membrane. Uh, a certain type of purpura uh, called henoch shanline purpura, we're not going to go into it now because it's not really a renal disease, but it is very, very often causing a type of IgA nephropathy. So whereas you had to kind of remember that IgA nephropathy is the same as Berger's disease, you can also remember that this entity is often found in a type of purpura called henoch shanline purpura. People with endocarditis can get glomerulonephropathies. That's not unusual because they're showering things into small blood vessels all the time. Good pasture syndrome, okay? So not only are antibodies attacking the basement membrane, the type four collagen of the kidney, but they're also attacking the basement membrane, the type four collagen of the lung. So what is good pasture syndrome? It's usually clinically renal failure and hemoptysis. Okay, it's a very, very hemorrhagic type of change within the lung. Uh, Wegener's granulomatosis and autoimmune disease, chiefly uh, involving the lung and upper respiratory tract, often produces a secondary glomerulonephritis on the basis of the fact that it's an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune diseases in general that are rich in antigen, antibody, circulating complexes, can produce a glomerular nephritis. Last but not least, multiple myeloma, okay? Not only does multiple myeloma predispose to amyloidosis because of chronic buildup of immune protein, but the myeloma kidney itself can produce a glomerular nephropathy type of picture. Okay, and somebody mentioned something which I probably should have mentioned. Somebody said, see Anka in Wegener. And of course, the answer is absolutely yes. Remember the anti neutrophilist antibodies called C Anka? That's very, very often a key feature in the Wegeners. Okay, well, you know what? I think we did a I think we did a good job today. I think my little hesitations about the technology were improved because of the adjustments. Uh, but we have uh, gone through a lot of lot of heavy renal pathology today, and in my opinion, we are through the the worst parts of the understanding of renal diseases. So, in my opinion, when you look at the tubules, when you look at uh, tumors, when you look at obstruction uh, factors, it's relatively uh, more logical than some of these concepts that we've introduced with the glomerular nephropathies. So, I, I think we're going to be done today. Let me see what my time is over here. Uh, yeah, actually, it is time to go. It's about 10 o'clock. Uh, on the next session, which will be tomorrow, which will be 22 hours from now, we're going to finish off the discussion on renal pathology. And then on Thursday, okay, we're going to review all of this stuff with the live students being present. So not only will you from around the world be with me at the recording sessions, but the students in a large, beautiful auditorium, very, very smart students, you know, this is an American medical school, will also be at the recording sessions as well. Now, I may not be devoting my specific mind to you who are the students in the sky. I may be devoting most of my focus and energy to the live bodies in front of me. So I don't know whether you're going to feel that neglect or not, but I guarantee if you probably type in a lot of chat questions, they're not going to be answered as easily as I was able to do today. So what's the uh, bottom line? We'll have another class tomorrow, same time, same place, uh, 22 hours. Then we're going to have a day off on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we'll start what I would call 
the Livenar, which is a webinar with live students as well. And by the way, you know, uh, during our little uh, interruption and break here, uh, there were uh, a lot of people that, you know, called me and asked me questions, when are we going to start, blah, blah, blah. So the, the, the key thing for you to remember is that when you receive your webinar announcements uh, online, you know, the little emails, those will be accurate. Now somebody just asked, will they be three times a week? The answer is sometimes, but not always. Sometimes they'll be two times a week. Sometimes they'll be three times a week. Sometimes, uh, I don't think they'll ever be four times a week, but I might have special sessions with the students, like board review sessions, and you may not be uh, on the uh, board review sessions, you, because that's not primarily pathology. I think what I'll do for my online students is just have them in the pathology sessions. Plus, the, the other sessions I'll be doing are not really quite uh, appropriate for what I'm doing over here. So. The other thing I wanted to mention is that even though we've had a lot of disruption, and originally when you signed up for this course, you were under the impression it was going to be every Tuesday, every Thursday, every Tuesday, every Thursday, 9 to 11 Chicago time, 9 to 11. Well, we've changed a little bit. And uh, I guess I should apologize a little bit for that, but if we didn't do the change, we wouldn't be able to do my experiment in synchronizing the uh, online students with the live students. So. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be only with you again, but then on Thursday, we'll all be together with the, the live students at San Juan Batista. And thank you for your, for coming today. When I did this last year, there were a lot of changes I had to make in the time and in the place and in the topic. And I wound up losing a massive number of online students. But what I'm seeing is that more than half of you, of my usual students, are are here even though we've uh, made the changes. So I want to thank you very much for that. You're very flexible. But I know that you are also experienced enough to know that if you can't make the session because it's at a different time, that you can always watch the movie. So as soon as I close off today after our last song, what we're going to do is um, make a movie, and hopefully I can get that online pretty quick. So um, thanks for coming. And as always, our last uh, song is sort of inspirational. And I can't think of a nicer, more beautiful, inspirational song than this one by R.E.O. Speed Wagon. See you in 22 hours. This be lady anymore. But I'll try to fight and fall. Who took the ship into the shore? You throw away the rules forever.
I can't fight this feeling anymore. Do what I find fighting for. Baby, I can't fight the stealing anymore. Rock on, you buzzards. <laughs>